Committee, committee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Pursuant to committee rule and House Rule 11, the chair announces that she may postpone roll call votes. Pursuant to notice, the committee meets to consider the following measures. H.R. 4091, ARPA E Reauthorization Act of 2019, H.R. 2051, Sustainable Chemistry Research and Development Act of 2019, and H.R. 1709, Scientific Integrity Act. Good morning and welcome to today's markup of three bills. I'm very pleased that we are considering the Bipartisan RPE Reauthorization Act of 2019 this morning. <clears throat> RPE stewards the development of high-risk, high-reward energy technologies that neither the private sector nor other DOE programs had previously been willing to support. After demonstrating a strong record of success over its first 10 years in operation and successfully passing numerous independent bipartisan and nonpartisan assessments over the last several years, it is clear that RPE has been a successful program. This bill will enable RPE to truly fulfill its potential to help transform our nation's energy infrastructure for a far cleaner and more prosperous future. The next bill we will consider is H.R. 2051, the Sustainable <coughs> Chemistry Research and Development Act of 2019, which is sponsored by the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, the Research and Technology Subcommittee held a hearing in July to explore the challenges and opportunities in sustainable chemistry. The committee heard from an expert panel of witnesses about the need for more research and technology development, improved chemistry education, and enhanced federal agency coordination to encourage the use of sustainable chemicals and processes throughout the chemical science and engineering enterprise. All of the witnesses spoke in support of H.R. 2051. This bipartisan bill is a good step to advance in the chemical innovations we need to reduce our reliance on substances that are hazardous to human health and the environment. I want to thank Mr. Lipinski for his leadership on this important issue. I'll also take a moment to mention that this bill has a companion in the Senate, which is sponsored by Senator Combs, and I know he's committed to moving this legislation forward. Hopefully, he can help us to get this important legislation enacted this Congress. Last, we will consider H.R. 1709, the Scientific Integrity Act. I want to thank Mr. Tonko for his leadership on this legislation which began in 2016 when he sought to codify the scientific integrity policies put in place under the Obama administration for all agencies that fund, conduct, and oversee scientific research. These policies were developed in response to 2010 memorandum from the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which in turn was in response to a requirement in the 2017 America Competes Act. <clears throat> this legislation brings our 2007 effort full circle by spelling out in law the core principles of a federal agency's scientific integrity policy. There are many specific principles addressing openness, transparency, and due process. At their essence, they are about protecting federal science and scientists from undue political influence and ensuring that the public can trust the science and scientific process in forming public policy decisions. H.R. 1709 has 218 co-sponsors and has earned an endorsement, the endorsements of 60 organizations. This is important legislation regardless of which party is in the White House, and I urge my colleagues to support it. I'd like also to take a moment to observe that we will be considering extensive amendments to each of these bills offered by all three bill sponsors. 
All of these amendments were formed with input from outside stakeholders and also extensive negotiations with ranking member Lucas and his staff. I greatly appreciate his efforts to reach bipartisan agreements and the efforts of both of our staffs to work together. It sometimes seems like compromise has become a dirty word in this town. I will be the first to acknowledge that compromise can be a less than satisfying, but I do not believe that our constituents sent us here to posture. There are real problems that need to be solved, and those problems won't be addressed if Democrats and Republicans always go their separate ways. I hope that the Science Committee will continue to be a place where people from both sides of the aisle can come together to pass good legislation, and I look forward to doing that today. I now recognize our ranking member, Mr. Lucas, for his remarks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And today we will consider three bills. The first is H.R. 4091, the ARPA E Reauthorization Act of 2019. After a lot of negotiation, I'm pleased to say we've reached a bipartisan consensus on this legislation, and I look forward to supporting the bill as amended. I want to thank the Chairwoman for being willing to come to the table and find a more measured approach we can all agree on. I believe the additional changes in the manager's amendments that we'll consider today will further strengthen this legislation. With this amendment, we'll double our investment in ARPA-E's high-risk, high-reward research over five years, but we'll also establish important guardrails to ensure that we're using our limited research dollars wisely and efficiently. To be sure, we're not using taxpayer dollars on innovation initiatives that industry can conduct. The bill requires grant applications to demonstrate they made sufficient attempts to fund projects without federal dollars. Importantly, this bill will address the problem of duplic duplication within ARPA-E. Like all federal programs, ARPA-E isn't perfect, and in the past, some initiatives have appeared to duplicate the efforts of other DOE programs. ARPA-E is meant to focus on cutting-edge research to enable transformative technologies. It can't do that if its resources are being drained by duplicative work conducted elsewhere in the department. This bill will require the department to prevent duplication between ARPA-E's initiatives and other research across DOE. I'm also pleased that the Chairwoman Johnson has agreed to join me in a GAO request seeking to add transparency to the program. With this report, I hope we can shed more light on unintended duplication and develop policies to prevent that from occurring in the future. Taken together, these initiatives will strengthen ARPA-E and refocus the program on its intended mission, serving as the bridge between basic research and industry-led innovation. The second bill on our agenda today is H.R. 2051, the Sustainable Chemistry Act of 2019. H.R. 2051 provides for federal coordination of research and development for new innovations in chemistry, manufacturing, and materials. This bill continues our committee's bipartisan commitment to prioritizing fundamental research for new technologies and the ideas that will drive the American economy into the future. Chemistry is essential to our economy and plays a vital role in helping to solve the greatest challenges facing the nation and our world. From farming to medicine to the applications we use, chemical manufacturing touches our lives every day. There's market demand for chemical products that use resources more efficiently and are safer for both humans and the environment. Consumers want these products to be just as effective or more effective than traditional chemical products. This bill will help support the research, training, and standards needed to meet these demands. It's rare that a bill has the endorsement of both the chemical companies and the environmental advocates. I thank the bill's sponsors, Representative Dan Lipinski and Representative John Molnar, for their leadership on this issue and for developing a good consensus bill. I encourage my colleagues to support it. The final bill on our agenda today is the Scientific, Scientific Integrity Act. I'll speak more about that when we consider the bill and I'll offer an amendment. But in the meantime, I appreciate Chairwoman Johnson and the bill's sponsor, Mr. Tonko, for working with us on a compromise that will be able to move the bill forward with my support. In the meantime, I look forward to considering our bipartisan bills on ARPA-E and sustainable chemistry. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much. We will now consider H.R. 4091, the ARPA-E Reauthorization Act of 2019. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 4091, a bill 
to amend the America Competes Act to reauthorize the ARPA-E program <coughs> and for other purposes. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open to amendment at any point. I recognize myself to speak on this bill. I'm pleased that we are now considering H.R. 4091. Before going into any further detail, I want to thank my friend, Ranking Member Lucas, for working with me to come to an agreement on the bill. After discussions between ourselves and our staff, I'm proud to say that we have achieved a genuine compromise that will allow us to support this bill together this morning. As I noted during the Energy Subcommittee markup, 4091 last month, ARPA-E has already <coughs> demonstrated incredible success in advancing high-risk, high-reward energy technology solutions that neither the public sector nor the private sector have been willing or able to support in the past. Industry leaders like Bill Gates, Chad Holliday, and Norman Alstein have repeatedly called for significantly increasing this agency's budget given the unique role that it is now playing in our energy innovation pipeline. ARPA's impressive track record now includes over $2.9 billion in private sector follow-on funding for a group of 145 RPE projects since the agency's founding in 2009. Equally notable, 76 projects have formed new companies, and that's one of the main goals here. We want American science investments to result in American innovation and high-tech <coughs> jobs. RPE projects have also had significant impacts on science, leading to thousands of peer-reviewed journal articles and 346 U.S. patents. Unfortunately, RPE has only been able to support about 1% of the proposals submitted for its open funding opportunities and 12% of the proposals submitted to the focused programs. Too many good ideas are falling by the wayside, and that ends up shifting the enormous potential of this program, stifling the enormous potential of the program. H.R. 4091 addresses this problem by authorizing substantial growth in support for the agency over the next five years. The growth is consistent with the National Academy's original recommendations for establishing and supporting RPE, as well as more recent recommendations from well-respected bipartisan, nonpartisan institutions, such as the Bipartisan Policy Center of America's Energy Innovation Council, the Energy Futures Initiative, and the Information Technology and, Inf and Innovation Foundation. H.L. 4091 incorporates extensive feedback from stakeholders, including constructive language from a, from a bill that I co-sponsored with Rankin Member Lucas last year. The bill will incorporate additional provisions proposed by the Rankin Member upon a passage of the manager's amendment today. I value the perspectives that the Rankin Member and my colleagues across the aisle bring to this committee and will continue to consider good ideas to improve our legislation wherever they come from. This bill is now endorsed by a broad coalition of organizations, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Bipartisan Policy Center, the Association of American Universities, the Nuclear Energy Institute, the American Petroleum Institute, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and Energy Storage Association, the Carbon Utilization Research Council, the American Council for Renewable Energy, the Environmental Defense Fund, and the Energy Sciences Coalition, just to name a few. RPE's unique work is one of the best tools we have to produce the innovation needed to maintain our international competitiveness and transition ourselves to a clean energy future. Given this bill's crucial mission, along with this deep support from our nation's leading industrial, academic, scientific, and environmental organizations, I am hopeful that all of my colleagues will strongly support advancing 4091 this morning. And does anyone else need to be recognized or desire to be recognized? 
The chair recognizes Mr. Lipinski. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Johnson. Uh, I just want to very briefly say RPE, I think, is one of the most important uh, programs that uh, we have making a difference and the pot potential to do even greater things for, for our country. And uh, when it comes to our, our position on science and in technology and innovation and uh, addressing a lot of the big problems that, that we face, uh, including um, climate issues and other very critical issues, I just want to say this is very important. I'm glad we've been able to come to this uh, agreement on this. I yield back. Thank you very much. Anyone? Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you, Chair Woman Johnson. I move to strike the last word. Chair, recognize your five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. I also serve, in addition to the um, Science Committee, I serve on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. And I just came from a hearing in that committee. And, you know, in Northwest Oregon, uh, we, climate change is a reality. We have acidic oceans that are threatening our shellfish industry on the Pacific coast. We have smoke from raging wildfires that's made air unhealthy to breathe. We have decreased snowpack that's limiting access to skiing and snowboarding, and that affects our outdoor recreation industry. We have droughts and extreme weather patterns that are jeopardizing the livelihoods of our farmers and our prestigious wineries. Uh, warmer water temperatures in the Columbia River that are endangering salmon, which are a fundamental part of the identity and culture of the Northwest tribes. And of course, rising sea levels that are threatening homeowners and small businesses in our coastal communities. Uh, if you look at the findings from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the fourth, also the fourth National Climate Assessment, it, it's more than a wake-up call, it's really an alarm. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions from human activities are the most substantial factor that account for observed warming over the past six decades, and carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are higher than at any time in the last <coughs> million, three million years. We know the climate crisis is a national emergency and an existential threat, and we have the imperative to act on climate and to transition to a clean energy economy no later than mid-century. And that transition can start by strengthening investments in research and development for clean energy, which is one of the reasons why I am so proud to co-sponsor co the Bipartisan RPE Reauthorization Act. The bill would more than double authorization for the agency to $1 billion by 2024. These funds will help support the high-risk but high-reward energy research that's not being addressed by the private sector. At current funding levels, RPE continues to identify more projects than can be funded. And it's worth noting that the increase in funding is consistent with the recommendations from the National Academies in their assessment rising above the gathering storm report. By authorizing $1 billion for ARPA-E, we can show leadership and also help accelerate the development of clean energy technologies. And importantly, we must complement federal high-risk, high-reward programs like ARPA-E with regional partnerships that can spur the development of early-stage innovations and help also move new technologies beyond laboratory research to market deployment. Uh, I'm working on a bill to help support the creation and expansion of regional private-public partnerships to foster an environment of innovation and job creation at the local level and to accelerate smart mar market deployment of clean energy technologies. And that is something that, you know, since the creation of ARPA-E, we have seen so much uh, growth in, in the private sector as well as the um, groundbreaking research. So it takes vision and persistence to pursue areas of research when the benefits are unknown at the outset. The federal government has a role as an active participant in this important work, and one part of that is providing robust funding for ARPA-E. So I thank Chairwoman Johnson for her leadership on this bipartisan bill. I also thank the ranking member for his collaboration, and I urge all of my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Any other requests for time? We will now proceed with the amendments in, in the order of the, on the roster. The chair's amendment. The first amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the chair. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number one. Amendment to committee print of H.R. 4091 offered by Ms. Johnson. I ask unanimous consent to dispense from re further reading and uh, without objection, so ordered. I recognize myself for five minutes to briefly explain the amendment. The manager's amendment represents an agreement between 
me and my friend, Mr. Lucas, to pass a major reauthorization of RPE out of this committee with strong bipartisan support. I greatly appreciate the hard work that he and his staff put into achieving this compromise. And I truly hope that this bodes well for all of our mutual efforts to advance the authorization of other important clean energy R&D programs going forward. I urge all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support the amendment, and I yield back. Is there further discussion? Madam Chair. Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. When we marked up H.R. 4091 in the Energy Subcommittee, I said that I believe there was an opportunity to find common ground and to reauthorize ARPA-E in a bipartisan way. I want to thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, for working with me to achieve that common ground through this manager's amendment. We both had to make compromises, but I believe we achieved consensus. And I believe this amendment is a responsible approach and will give us the best chance to see a robust reauthorization bill signed into law. I introduced a bill in July to reauthorize and reform ARPA-E, and the manager's amendment we are considering today includes elements of that bill that were essential for reaching bipartisan consensus. RPE is, is meant to advance cutting edge technologies that are too high risk for industry, but have the potential to revolutionize energy production, development, and use in America. This is vitally important work, and RPE is unique in its ability to do this. So it's critical that even as we grow the program's resources, we make sure that we're going to fund work within RPE's mission, not duplicative research, and development that can be better funded by other DOE programs or the private industry. This manager's amendment goes a long way towards eliminating the duplication between ARPA-E and other Department of Energy research. It also creates a more rigorous approval process that ensures applicants have first sought private investment before applying for RPE grants. These reforms, in addition to the reforms included in the original legislation, have given us the opportunity to pass a bipartisan bill that benefits taxpayers while strengthening the transformational energy research. I want to thank the chairwoman for working with me on this bill, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the vote will occur on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, we now will hear the uh, Foster Amendment. The chairs, the next amendment on the roster is offered by the gentleman from Illinois, and he's recognized to offer the amendment. Uh, thank you. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number two, amendment to H.R. 4091, offered by Mr. Foster. I ask unanimous consent to dispense from the reading without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain this amendment. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chairwoman. I'm introducing this amendment to establish a chief evaluation officer position at RPE. In 2017, the National Academies issued a comprehensive assessment of RPE. While the report was generally <coughs> positive in terms of RPE's technological advancements and effective pro program and project management, the authors noted a few areas in need of improvement. One area in need of attention was RPE's evaluation and assessment program. The, agent, the Academy found that the agency is not yet able to fully assess the full extent of its impact and achievement of its statutory mission and goals. They also found that RPE is doing a poor job of creating awareness of it, its success in enhancing the economic and energy security of the United States. The report recommended that, quote, the RPE director and program director should develop and implement a framework for measuring and assessing the agency's impact in achieving its mission and goals, unquote. I do not want to be overly prescriptive in telling RPE how to better measure and assess the, its impact or better communicate its success to lawmakers and the general public. My amendment simply creates a position of chief evaluation officer, a position which is successfully used in other agencies. A chief evaluation officer coordinates, promotes, sponsors, and builds capacity within a federal department to help the agency understand and conduct evaluations. The results of these evaluations can be used to improve policies and programs, as well as to communicate the success of the agency to the public. 
it will be left up to RPE and the Chief Evaluation Officer to determine how best to measure impact and communicate its success. Now, since introducing my amendment, I have recently learned that RPE now plans to hire an evaluation impact assessment expert to help them respond to the National Academy's recommendations. So, Mr. Ms. Ms. Chairwoman, I withdraw my amendment and look forward to working with the agency to ensure that this critically important role is filled using existing authorities. And I yield back. Thank you very much. Are there any other amendments? Uh, any wish for time? If not, a reporting quorum being present, I move that the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology Report H.R. 4091 as amended to the House with the recommendation that the bill be approved. Those in favor of their motion can signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Hearing none, the motion is carried. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table, and I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make any necessary technical and conforming changes to the bill. Without objection, so ordered. Members will have two subsequent calendar days in which to submit supplementary minority and additional views on this measure. We will now consider H.R. 2051, the Sustainable Chemistry Research and Development Act of 2019. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 2051, a bill to provide for federal coordination of activities supporting sustainable chemistry and for other purposes. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open to amendment at any point. I recognize Ms. Lipinski to speak on the bill. Thank you, thank you uh, Chairwoman Johnson. I was proud to introduce H.R. 2051, Sustainable Chemistry R&D Act, along with my Republican Chemistry Caucus co-chair, Mr. Molinar. I thank many of my colleagues on this committee, including Chairwoman Johnson, for co-sponsoring this bipartisan amendment. I've long supported efforts to coordinate federal programs that support basic research at our national labs and universities, because coordination helps maximize the return on our investments. The Sustainable Chemistry R&D Act does this. I've also made a priority to work on ways to increase the transition of research conducted in these labs into new and better products. The Sustainable Chemistry R&D Act does this also. Products we interact with in nearly every sector of the economy, including cleaning supplies, dyes, pesticides, and flame retardants, rely on innovations in chemistry. As co-chair of the Chemistry Caucus, I hear from industry that sustainable chemistry is a field particularly in need of federal attention. American businesses face global competition to meet consumer demand for products that have been designed with forethought to their impacts. We want affordable products that meet our needs and protect human health and our environment. It is better for our environment if products are created from sustainably sourced materials. It is better to use less energy and safer chemicals in the production process. And it is far better to minimize harmful waste than to try to clean it up later. Basic research in sustainable chemistry informs industrial design of products with these principles in mind. This is an opportunity for federal, academic, and industry partners to work together in a way that will grow our economy and improve public health in our environment. H.R. 2051 highlights the importance of sustainable chemistry and directs coordination of programs to support sustainable chemistry across the federal government. Specifically, the bill establishes an interagency coordination entity under the direction of the Office of Science and Technology Policy to develop a national roadmap for sustainable chemistry. This roadmap will include a definition of sustainable chemistry, a framework for characterizing sustainability, an assessment of the state of sustainable chemistry in the US, including major challenges and roadblocks. In carrying out those activities, the interagency coordination entity is directed to consult with external stakeholders, including industry, the scientific community, state, tribal, and local or governments, and non-governmental organizations. This bill also authorizes relevant federal agencies to incorporate sustainable chemistry principles in their existing research, development, demonstration, tech transfer, education, and training activities. 
Finally, this bill authorized the creation of a new public-private partnerships in sustainable chemistry, allowing for new research to directly inform industrial innovation and for students to gain experience addressing industrial challenges. I ask my colleagues to support this bipartisan bill to strengthen U.S. chemical industry by providing the tools needed to lead the world to a safer environment. With that, I will yield back. Thank you, Mr. Klinsky. Anyone else wishing to be recognized? Now we'll proceed with any amendments uh, in the order on the roster. There's an amendment in the nature of the substitute. The first amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois, and he is recognized to offer his amendment. Uh, Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number one, amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2051. I have unanimous consent to dispense with the reading and without objection. So ordered, I recognize the gentleman to explain his amendment. Five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. My amendment in the nature of a substitute makes minor but important changes to this bill in response to feedback received since it was introduced. For example, during the hearing, during a hearing of a subcommittee on research and technology, we heard about a need for consensus definition for sustainable chemistry. Therefore, this amendment specifically directs the interagency coordination entity to develop and update this definition to guide activities described in the bill. Similarly, this amendment requires the development of metrics for assessing sustainability so we can ensure that the activities described in the bill continue moving in the right direction. It also includes a 10-year sunset for the entity to complete the coordination efforts. Finally, this amendment broadens the authorization for agency activities to promote sustainable chemistry principles in public outreach, as well as an education curriculum from elementary school through graduate training. I want to emphasize that students of all ages can benefit from knowing more about sustainable chemistry. I'd like to thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, as well as experts outside experts for engaging with my office in the development of this amendment, which will improve the bill. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Yep. Any further discussion? Any requests for time? If there's no further discussion, then the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. A reporting quorum being present, I move that the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology report 2051 as amendment to the House with a recommendation that it be approved. Those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The nays, the ayes have it and the bill is reported favorably. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table, and I ask unanimous consent for staff to be authorized to make any necessary technical and conforming changes to the bill. Without objection, so ordered. Members will have two subsequent calendar days in which to submit supplemental minority or additional views on this measure. We will now consider H.R. 1706, the Scientific Integrity Act. The <coughs> clerk will report the bill. H.R. 1709, a bill to amend the America Competes Act to establish certain scientific integrity policies for federal agencies that fund, conduct, or oversee scientific... Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open to amendment at any point. Uh, I will recognize the bill sponsor, Mr. Tonko, to speak to the bill. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, and thank you for your longstanding support of the Scientific Integrity Act. Thank you also to Chairwoman Stevens for your very strong support of the bill and to ranking members Lucas and Baird for helping us to move the bill in a bipartisan fashion. I also want to thank the 226 members who have supported this common sense good government legislation. As an engineer with a deep respect for science, federal scientific integrity standards have been a concern of mine for many years. Allowing a political power or special interest to manipulate or suppress federal science hurts, hurts all of us. 
We have seen over and over that when government scientific reports are delayed, distorted, or hidden, the American people pay the price in the form of lost rights and freedoms, certainly in lost wages to medical bills, burned or flooded homes, lost years from our lives, and the irreplaceable loss of loved ones. These are the very consequences that scientific integrity policies exist to prevent. Scientific integrity is a long-standing concern that transcends any one party or political administration. In fact, I began working on the Scientific Integrity Act in the summer of 2016 when we had a Democratic administration. And the fact remains, whether a Democrat or a Republican sits in the Speaker's chair or the Oval Office, we need strong scientific integrity policies. This bill, H.R. 1709, would do just that insulating public scientific research and reports from the distorting influence of political and special interests by ensuring strong scientific, scientific integrity standards at America's science agencies. More than 20 federal agencies have some form of a scientific integrity policy, but those policies are uneven in their enforcement and in their scope. <coughs> Earlier this year, more than 60 organizations sent a letter to the Committee on, in support of Congress moving the Scientific Integrity Act forward. I want to thank all of those groups for their support. Dr. Baird, thank you again for your studious support and your leadership on the nonpartisan need for strong, consistent scientific integrity policies and for working with me to move this important legislation forward. I have long believed that there should be room for bipartisan action. It can be easy to dismiss any call for accountability or transparency as politically motivated. I am pleased to say that this is not the case when it comes to scientific integrity. During our Science Committee legislative hearing on the Scientific Integrity Act in July, both Republican and Democratic witnesses spoke of the need for strong scientific integrity policies that transcend politics or partisanship. Dr. Roger Pilkey, the Republican witness, agreed calling on Congress to, and I quote, quickly and in bipartisan fashion pass scientific integrity legislation, close quote. Today, we heed that call. I also want to thank my friends, ranking members, Lucas and Barrett again. Through your leadership, we have strengthened the bill, including strengthening reporting requirements to Congress, making scientific integrity policies easier for all to access, and adding more uh, specificity to several positions, provisions. I also want to thank Dalia Sokolov on the Science Committee staff, who has worked on this with my staff. And I have to give a shout out to Emily Dehovney for several years providing expertise and critical support. Thank you to Jamie, to Janie Thompson and Jen Wicker for their work on getting this across the finish line. And thank you to all my colleagues on this committee for championing scientific integrity. Science doesn't serve political power especially when American taxpayers are subsidizing it. At its best, science just tries to tell us the truth, and that is always worth protecting. I hope that we can continue to work together as a committee to strengthen America's scientific integrity policies and make certain that we uphold high scientific standards across all federal science agencies, no matter what party is in office. I ask for your support on today's vote on Scientific Integrity Act. And with that, Madam Chair, again, thank you for your help, your leadership in this capacity, and with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Anyone wishing to be recognized? Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Strike the last word. I, uh, I, th I thank the gentleman for uh, following this well-intentioned legislation. I think there's a great need for it. I wasn't on a committee that had a hearing on this, so uh, I'm unfamiliar whether or not a, a number of my questions have been answered. I'd appreciate a list of um, agencies that would be covered by this. I think you mentioned there were 20 agencies, and I'd greatly appreciate knowing what those 20 agencies are. Um, <clears throat> I notice there's no penalty for any violation, so uh, uh, unless it's in, in another part of the code somewhere, uh, it's kind of a paper tiger. We're saying you can't do all these things, uh, but if they're violated or transgressed, I, I don't see any apparent penalty for that. Um, I hesitate to, to, to drop kick uh, to unelected, unaccountable, unrecallable bureaucrats' abilities to make laws uh, known as the rulemaking process. And here we give them carte blanche authority uh, to, run, to run wild, to develop uh, scientific 
uh, integrity policy and to uh, develop the process. And I, I think it's really the responsibility of Congress uh, to determine what that policy is. Once they determine what the policy is, the unelected, unaccountable, unaccountable, uh, recallable uh, bureaucrats, uh, then the only way uh, we can change that policy is to override it, which I think everyone in this committee knows is not a simple matter. So uh, just would like to express those concerns and, and hope maybe uh, they might be addressed at some point uh, before this thing goes to a final vote on the floor. And I, I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing? Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. I move to strike the last word. You recognize five minutes. Thank you. Peer-reviewed evidence-based science can and should support and inform policies. Unfortunately, too often we have seen the suppression, censorship, and manipulation of science. I'm a proud co-sponsor of the Scientific Integrity Act, which would direct federal agencies that conduct or fund scientific research to develop and enforce scientific integrity policies to make sure that scientists and engineers adhere to the highest ethical and professional standards when conducting research, drawing conclusions, and disseminating findings. Our consideration of the Scientific Integrity Act is very timely. Last month, weather forecasting and science became contentious during Hurricane Dorian, and it jeopardized the safety of our communities. I want to acknowledge the public servants in the National Weather Service Birmingham office who helped defend scientific integrity in what unfortunately became a very political moment. It's also important to highlight NOAA Acting Chief Scientist Craig McLean's pledge to investigate. Fortunately, NOAA's scientific integrity policy is one of the strongest across the federal government, but too many federal agencies still lack a comprehensive scientific integrity policy, and the policies that do exist are ultimately only as strong as their enforcement. Violations of scientific integrity are not exclusive to the Trump administration. As Mr. Tonko noted, we need to have an effective, enforceable scientific integrity policy to counter not only the current administration, but also any future administration that may be hostile towards science. I thank Congressman Tonko for his leadership on this bill, which I know has been over the last several years. I, I urge all of my colleagues to support the bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Any other requests for time? Madam Chair, can, I'd like to strike Mr. the last Lucas. word. Madam Chair, thank you. I'd like to address an inquiry to Mr. Tonko, to my colleague, Mr. Tonko. Aren't we talking about a situation where these rules are already in place by executive order from the previous administration? There are rules in place that uh, not, are not always standardized or equally applied, and we want to make certain. Is it your understanding, has the present administration done anything to undo that executive order that's in place? The executive order that? That puts these rules in place, place that, we're, that you're I addressing by codification. I believe they're still in place. And with the amendment I'll offer soon and the efforts that we've worked on together, isn't it fair to say that this refines and addresses this issue in a more straightforward fashion? I believe so. I think it uh, makes improvements, and certainly we still have oversight as Congress. So I think putting this into play with a standardized approach with implementation that is watched and, and guaranteed, I believe we then have uh, the efforts of scientific research serving us as a, as a country really and In well. a practical sense, if we do nothing today, then the executive order standing from the previous administration as it's been applied will still be, the, in essence, the, the law of the land, so to speak. It would be, yeah. I only ask you questions we can both answer. Yeah. Thank you, my colleague. <laughs> yield so, back. W w yeah. Thank you for your help, by the way, sir. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Ms. Cheryl. Ms. Cheryl. I move to strike the last word. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for holding today's markup, and thank you to Representative Tonko for introducing this important legislation. Back in July, Representative Stevens and I held a joint subcommittee hearing on scientific integrity at federal agencies. That hearing made it clear that the goal of protecting science and scientists is a cause that members from both sides of the aisle care deeply about. We must all be skeptical of attempts to politicize science. America faces immense challenges today, accelerating climate change, attacks on women's health, dangerous chemicals in our water, aging transportation networks, and so much more. We cannot adequately understand these threats, let alone address them, with anything less than the best possible science. 
This nation has the best scientists in the world. And those who work with the federal government are working to help us overcome the greatest challenges of our time. When we allow federal scientists to do their jobs without interference, their efforts make the country stronger, safer, and more prosperous. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of the Scientific Integrity Act. This bill will codify scientific integrity policies at federal agencies and strengthen them in crucial ways. It will guarantee that federal scientists can conduct research freely, present findings honestly, and engage with the scientific community. It will also ensure that when scientific integrity violations do occur, federal scientists know their rights and can report the violations to designated officials who are empowered to help. Once again, I want to thank Representative Tonko, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and Representative Stevens for their leadership on this issue. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Any other requests for time? Okay. We will now proceed with the amendments in the order of the roster. The first amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the General from New York, and he's recognized to offer his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number one. Am I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading and without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I won't take all that time. My, my amendment is an amendment in the nature of a substitute. As I mentioned earlier, we have strengthened the bill, including strengthening reporting requirements to Congress, making scientific integrity policies easier for all to access, and adding more specificity to several uh, positions. We also strengthened the bill by adding Comptroller General review of implementation of the policies and regular convening of the scientific integrity officers of the various agencies to discuss best practices. It's straightforward, it's been agreed to, and I ask for your support for this amendment, Madam Chair. With that, I yield back. Are there comments on the amendment? Hearing none. We will move to the next amendment and vote on the Tonko Amendment later. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by a ranking member. This is um, recognized to offer, he is recognized to offer his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. Mr. Lucas is recognized for five minutes. Oh, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment number two, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1709. I ask unanimous consent to dispense of the reading and without objection, so ordered. I now recognize uh, Mr. Lucas for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Let me start by saying that we all agree government scientists should be able to conduct their research free from suppression, intimidation, coercion, or manipulation. Scientists should be able to publish their research in peer-reviewed journals, participate in scientific conferences, and engage with their colleagues on, in science. This produces better science for the federal government and for our nation. Federal scientists, like all other federal employees, enjoy many protections in the workplace. In addition to these protections, research agencies already have specific or have scientific integrity policies in place through a standing executive order. Still, there's room to improve our federal research enterprise. Unfortunately, the initial bill took a, a, what I would describe as a sledgehammer to the problem that requires a scalpel. The bill was also prescriptive that it got into the weeds on how scientists manage their media request. Now, I greatly appreciate the work Mr. Tonko's personal staff and Chairwoman Johnson's committee staff undertook to develop an amendment that addresses many of these issues. However, I have one remaining concern about how it continues to dictate in legislation how federal scientists and agencies handle media requests. My amendment strikes those provisions and simply leaves it up to the agencies and administrations to manage their own media policies. Many agencies already have media procedures in place as a part of their scientific integrity policies, and those would be able to continue under this bill. Every administration deserves the opportunity to shape policy and message. That's why we hold elections. The job of scientists is to conduct research, and the job of policymakers is to develop policy, which is a complicated process that involves weighing many factors, including science. Science should also help inform po uh, policy, not be policy. 
It is my understanding that Mr. Tonko intends to accept my amendment. I want to thank the gentleman for working with us. With my amendment's adoption, I will support passage of the bill and encourage all my colleagues to do so. I hope we can continue working together on other ways to ensure integrity of the research enterprise, and there's valuable work to be done there. Again, thank you, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, any other persons wishing to be recognized? Mr. Tonko. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. We'll recognize for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Ranking Member Lucas, for your willingness to work together on moving this forward. As part of our agreement on the overall bill, I will support the passage of this amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same. I believe the end result here is a great respect for our nation's scientists whose work will be um, all the more readily available without any sort of infringement. So with that, I thank you, and I yield back the remainder of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other requests for time? There's no further discussion, and the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. We will now vote on the amendment in the nature of the substitute ordered by Mr. Tonko as amended. <coughs> the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The amendment is agreed to. A reporting quorum being present, I remove that the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology report H.R. 1709 as amendment amended to the House with the recommendation that the bill be approved. Those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it, and the bill is favorably approved, reported. Mr. Madam Chair, yes. I request a uh, recorded vote, please. Uh, there's been a report, a request for a vote. We'll re recess for five minutes and take the vote.
if the committee will come to order, the clerk will call the roll. Chairwoman Johnson. Aye. Chairwoman Johnson, aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren, aye. Mr. Lipinski. Aye. Mr. Lipinski, aye. Ms. Bonamici. Aye. Ms. Bonamici, aye. Mr. Barra. Aye. Mr. Barra, aye. Mr. Lamb. Aye. Mr. Lamb, aye. <coughs> Ms. Fletcher. Aye. Ms. Fletcher, aye. Ms. Stevens. Aye. Ms. Stevens, aye. Ms. Horn. Ms. Horn, aye. Ms. Cheryl. Aye. Ms. Cheryl, aye. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Cohen. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko, aye. Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster, aye. Mr. Byer. Mr. Byer, aye. Mr. Christ, Mr. Christ, aye. Mr. Caston, Mr. Caston, aye. Ms. Hill, Mr. McAdams, Mr. McAdams, aye. Ms. Wexton, Ms. Wexton, aye. Mr. Lucas, aye. Mr. Lucas, aye. Mr. Brooks, Mr. Brooks, no. Mr. Posey, Mr. Posey, no. Mr. Weber. Mr. Babin, Mr. Biggs, Mr. Biggs, aye. Mr. Marshall, Mr. Norman, Mr. Norman, aye. Mr. Cloud, Mr. Cloud, no. Mr. Balderson, Mr. Balderson, no. Mr. Olson, Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Gonzalez, Aye. Mr. Waltz? No. Mr. Waltz? No. Mr. Baird? Aye. Mr. Baird? Aye. Ms. Herrera Butler? Ms. Herrera Butler? Aye. Mr. Rooney? Mr. Murphy? Mr. Murphy? No. Is everyone recorded? The clerk will report. Chairwoman, the ayes are 25 and the noes are six. The bill is favorably reported. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. I ask unanimous consent that staff be authorized to make any necessary technical and conforming changes to the bill. Without objection, so ordered. Members will have two subsequent calendar days in which to submit supplemental minority or additional views on the measure. I want to thank all the members for their attendance, and this concludes our markup. The committee is adjourned.